Is that difficult for you? Um, <laughs> I am going to take on the ad hoc role of the lot, I think. Um, and so my name is Ashley Miller. I'm a feminist media scholar, um, getting my PhD currently in mass communications. And I am, one, a big movie fan, and two, a big fan of Shakespeare. So I will be trying to direct, I will probably be directing the questions in a somewhat movie-based fashion towards the end, because I enjoy talking about that. But for now, let me um, go left to right and okay. uh, introduce themselves. Um, I am Elizabeth Bear. I write science fiction and fantasy. A certain significant percentage of that science fiction and fantasy is somehow Elizabethan theater related. Uh, the most relevant books are a duology collectively titled The Stratford Man, which, how do I put this? It's a, it's a novel about fairies in Elizabethan England that grew out of being trapped at a fac Christmas faculty dinner with my ex-husband's fellow English teachers, one of whom was a staunch Oxfordian, and I wrote this 900-page novel so I didn't strangle him at the table. <laughs> Sublimation is great for your creativity. <laughs> and, and I know nothing about movies, so that part of the conversation, I mean, move out to the audience. I'm Alexandra Howes. I'm a currently high school English and theater teacher, and before that I used to work in professional theater and I've actually portrayed a number of, of the women we're going to talk about today on stage. And a lot of my background is in the Elizabethan era, as well as acting styles and uh, hopefully getting my students to care about these characters as well when the school year happens. Uh, my name is Greg Weissman. Uh, I'm uh, mostly a writer of comic books and cartoons. Uh, I was the creator of Gargoyles and brought a lot of... Uh, I'm a big Shakespeare fanboy. Um, geek. Uh, so brought a lot of Shakespeare into uh, uh, Gargoyles and including uh, characters of Macbeth and the Weird Sisters and uh, Oberon, Titania, and Puck were all in there. Um, I've also uh, Written a, I've written two novels. Uh, the first, Reign of the Ghosts, is out now. Please buy it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the second, Spirits of Ash and Foam, uh, actually comes out Tuesday. Uh, and there are two books in the series set in a, on a chain of Caribbean islands. And um, Shakespeare's The Tempest runs through uh, both. Well, it's a nine book series in theory. I've only written two of them. But, uh, uh, runs through the whole series, so uh, mostly that's just about me loving Shakespeare a lot, and so that's where my interest lies. Well, I think a good place to start is probably what the hell does proto-feminist mean? <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I, my interpretation is strong female characters who are unusually well-defined and independent considering the era in which they were written. But I, I don't know if any of you have a competing definition. It's the, it's the stage before meiosis, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I kind of take, uh, take exception to the term for the era, because it seems to me that there are a lot of good female characters, not just in Shakespeare. Um, in Elizabethan drama, and we have this maybe tendency as modern readers to assume that everybody was as crappy at portraying women as the Victorians were. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, I mean, the, because the the, um, the Regency era writers had some of those things. Uh, there's, um, you know, so everybody, so I see there's a literary tradition of everybody from, you know, I mean, it goes to Homer. I mean, you can go yeah. pre-Elizabethan and all the way back to the classics and have very feminist characters that are, are well-rounded and have flaws that aren't just, you know, right. archetypes of, of and, women. And, and even when you've got that whole sort of Victorian angel of the house mm -hmm. thing, poisoning stuff, you still get characters like Irene Adler, you know, mm -hmm. who... 
Um, every so often, women sort of stand up and go, hi, I'm still cool. <laughs> so, but um, the, thing, the thing for me that's, that's really interesting about, uh, all right, yeah, that's probably later, somebody else should talk about it. Yeah, I guess for the proto-feminists, I mean, if you just look at kind of the dictionary definition, it's just, they call it proto because there was no really technical term for feminists. No, no feminist theory. theory. Yeah. yeah, and so that's just... Or right. so perhaps why it's called proto-feminist, even though we, you know, you, we can go look back as modern people and argue, yes, this character perhaps would be a feminist if they had had some term for that. Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to catch your breath first? Captain of a ferry band, Maine Helen is here at hand, and the fool is to buy me waiting for him. <laughs> I am late. <laughs> Any final uh, thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're too late. Things happen. Drama. <laughs> Mistakes were made. <laughs> um, my name is Joseph Erickson. I'm a Shakespeare enthusiast. I was hoping to add more of a historical context to the discussion. <laughs> um. <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Again, sorry I'm late. It's Sunday morning, 11 o'clock. It's okay. It's fine. Most of these people were late too. Perfectionist. So. Um, uh, well, you know, I, I don't. I'm not. I don't have anything brilliant to add to the definition of what's already been said. I mean, I think uh, to me the uh, term is fairly clear. I mean, um, the word feminist didn't exist when Shakespeare was writing, but that didn't mean that he wasn't a feminist. Um, I think he was a feminist. I just think that, you know, if you don't have the terminology, um, I'm not saying he's a perfect feminist, but, uh, right. but I think ultimately, you know, that society falls on if you want to put it in black and white terms, but since the term didn't exist, thus we have the proto. Mm -hmm. So we were asking uh, if anyone had a, an interpretation of what proto-feminist meant, um, if you had anything to add to that. Um, well, I guess I think he said, it's just, I believe the basis of the meeting with this discussion is about the, you know, character, the female characters of strength in Shakespeare in a time when most of it was, you know, passive, submissive characters, when he's got, you know, daughters telling, objecting to their parents. For one reason or another, either Romeo and Juliet or bits of Midsummer's Dream, and um, like it, as you said, it, as long he wasn't perhaps not consciously doing it, but there's definitely stuff there. Yeah, I mean, taking independent action, but, um, not just for reasons of romance either. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, oh, yeah. Rosalind or uh, um, Cleopatra or uh, Cordelia. Yeah, I think it's a really good point too. You know, examples like that where you you've got characters, um, for better for worse, often not always in their own best interest necessarily, but um, making independent choices and, and and what sort of proves it for me is that um, uh, I think Juliet, uh, given how young she is, is making astoundingly independent choices, but there's not a lot of proof there because uh, she's doing it for romantic reasons, and so one can argue, well, it's just because she wants the guy, but there are other characters in Shakespeare's canon that are doing it for reasons that don't have anything to do with romance. That sort of indicates to me that, um, I don't know whether ahead of his time is the right phrase, but just aware. Yeah. Of, just to jump in about Julian, I guess I don't see it as being problematic in that case if she's standing up for her own choices. Like, I love you teaching Juliet, Romeo and Juliet, to my ninth graders, because I'm like, here's a girl, she's just 13, standing up to her father. And yes, even though it has to do with decisions of, you know, of choice in, in romantic or marriage affairs, I mean, she clearly is the more intelligent of the couple of Juliet and <laughs> Yeah, this is very interesting. I mean, I love Romeo, but I mean, he, he is more, I mean, 
in the sense of kind of how Shakespeare writes and what might be a more stereotypical feminine role of being very emotional. He's always got a sword to his neck. And, and then yet Juliet is the one who, she doesn't jump into it right away. She's like, are you for real, Romeo? You're not just going to use me? I mean, is our love real? And I mean, she's really methodical about it. And then she stands up to her father at 13 years of age. And I think it's really... I mean, she's a really fascinating character. Okay, so I've got a history with this yeah. play. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about it a little bit. When I was in junior high and high school. I say, oh, well, what did a teacher do? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but at the time, I, uh, when I was, uh, I guess, a junior, senior in high school, uh, my girlfriend and I both hated this play, Romeo and Juliet the girlfriend I had at the time, um, for similar and yet different reasons. I just thought Romeo was the biggest moron on the planet, <laughs> and that with a, just a little modicum of intelligence, he could have avoided the whole mess. She felt similarly about Julia, um, and we would have long arguments about which one was dumber. <laughs> um, what I found in my 50s as I, is that the older I got, the more sympathy I had for these characters. And it seems to me, um, this might be slightly off topic, that uh, the father in Shakespeare is writing Romeo and Juliet. Because what I found, particularly with my daughter who thinks Juliet is a huge idiot, and my son who thinks Romeo is a huge idiot, um, <laughs> my teenage kids, um, is that the older you get, the more sympathy you have for these uh, really young kids in a world that's outside their control, trying to exert some control, and failing. Mm -hmm. um, but just uh, your sympathy for them grows by leaps and bounds for me as you get older. I, agree. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to clarify, I wasn't saying that Juliet uh, doesn't uh, Take action and doesn't. Uh, what I was saying is, is that if you, if all of Shakespeare's women um, only took action for reasons of love, um, that wouldn't necessarily demonstrate his uh, um, awareness, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't want to fault Juliet because that's why she. That's the impetus for why she does what she does. But what I was, the point I was trying to make is because he also has characters who, female characters who, who take action for other reasons. It, you know, because it's same to uh, a male character. There's some males who take action for love, some males who take action for ambition, all sorts of different reasons. Um, uh, but the, the indication for me that Shakespeare had, whether conscious or not, an awareness that women were actually human beings and not just mm -hmm. totems. Um, is that his female characters across the board run the gamut for their motivations, and it's not all because of uh, a guy. Mm -hmm. I think one aspect of this is the play starts with Romeo in a sycamore grove, sycamore, lovesick, lamenting, wow, well, somebody else who dumped him, who rejected him. So it's not just they, you know, Romeo and Juliet met for the first time, this is their first love. But there's that aspect of, is Romeo really into her, or is this just another chick he wants to fall on? Romeo is for pretty, not for smart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, he does. He, he, he staggers from his complete infatuation with it, it, Rosamond, right? It's been a while. Yes, Rosalind. 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 Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, He's completely besotted with her, and then the instant he lays eyes on Julia, this other woman is just completely forgotten, and he's off after the new girl. And I, I knew that guy in high school. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty accurate summation of a certain personality type. Um, and I think it's reasonable for Juliet to be a little cautious about this guy. Well, and especially with, if you look at her parents and their, I mean, if you really get into the Capulets more and the failed marriage and, yeah. and, and read and infer through the lines of that lady Capulet, got very, married very young, arranged marriage, had a child already, who was obviously Juliet, and then, uh, you know, there's just an interesting mother-daughter dynamic that I, 
you know, would be really interesting to explore more just between those two and how Lady Capulet feels. You know, she she's the one who wants to force this on, and then obviously Capulet has a different role where he does a big, you know, 180. Um, well, yeah, Lady Capulet can't be more than 30. Oh, exactly. You know, I mean, Capulet's got to be in his 50s. Yeah, he's yeah. an older man. It's fascinating the character of the nurse who seems to know more about Juliet than Lady Cat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the whole speech of mm -hmm. raising. Well, how old is she now? Can you tell me that? Mm -hmm. And just this huge, funny rant about how young Juliet is. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing that would be um, interesting is to go down the line and talk about who, for you, is the most representative of a feminist type in. Shakespeare's work. Uh, Rosalind slash Ganymede, definitely. You know, she just, first of all, she's got the best lines. And the entire play hangs, hangs on her. Um, there's this, this very cool thing that happens in, um, she, and, and it's far too early for me to remember dates or, or actual sequences of plays right now, but there's this very interesting thing that happens in sort of Shakespeare's middle, uh, comedies and, and some of the tragedies as well, where he fairly obviously had to, as, as I'm sure everybody in the room already knows, as you know Bob, all the women in Shakespeare were played by men because there were no women on the Elizabethan stage. So there's that interesting, like, when, when, you, when you've got women dressing up as men, dressing up as women. Pretending to be themselves. Yes. Pretending to be themselves, exactly. Um, but you also have, it's pretty obvious that he had two really good young actors at a certain point to work with. Because remember, he was writing for a particular troupe. He was writing to his actors. And you have these two boys who are um, constantly cast as sisters or best friends or you know, two, two young women of roughly the same age, uh, Helena and Hermia. It's, and, and it's pretty obvious from context that one of them was dark and one was fair and one was short and one was tall because there are a whole bunch of jokes about that written mm -hmm. into the plays. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he, had, he wanted to write for these two actors because they were fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, and quite possibly fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and, and get them on the stage because they're popular. The, so he would write these incredibly strong roles for them, but Elizabethan England was also kind of a police state. And there was a master of the rebels who was essentially a censor. There are plays that are lost to us because the master of the rebels said, you can't put that on. Uh, ben Johnson's Isle of Dogs, no copy remains, not even a scrap of paper. So what I really wonder is how, you know, how all of his plays, all of Shakespeare's plays sort of end with this social reset at the end where the women get to be strong and fabulous and then get put back into their place. I really wonder how much of that is Social is censorship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And more of yeah, how society was looking and going, oh, yeah. you know, where Shakespeare might have wanted to have pushed it, but yeah, yeah. so many so, things in place. Yeah, Taming of the Shrew would be like yeah. such a perfect example of right. that. Like, do you read that sarcastically or do you read that straight? And uh, is that a way to just get around censorship? Like, we're right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, lines at the end. You guys know about the, the chain of being, right? The, the Elizabethan <laughs> idea that, that everything descends from God through the sovereign, mm -hmm. through the nobles. You know, and, and everybody has their hierarchical place, um, and a man's hierarchical place is above his wife. The this is this is just the way it works, and to challenge that, here's here's the really tricky thing. To challenge that is actually treasonous because you're challenging the queen's right to rule. So you just you can't do that. Or you, but you can sort of nibble away at it and then go, ha ha, I was only fooling, and maybe still have talked about it. Mm -hmm. I guess, gosh, this is hard for me. Um, I have to go between Beatrice, which might be a bit of a cliche, but I mean, what a but fabulous, awesome. what a fabulous character. Just her, what she, I mean, how she, her language is written is just so wonderfully witty and intelligent, and. Um, and her relationship with Benedict, I just think is kind of... You can tell what Josh Whedon thinks that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just that quick-witted, you know, back and forth. And I do like Lady Macbeth in the sense of... I think Lady Macbeth almost is too much of that. You can maybe say she's too much unstrong, you know, 
evil woman, but I do like that there are tropes with her played around with you know, she she doesn't have children. And she's got a different drive for herself than maybe typical for, for characters like her. And just her role with her husband and, and how I mean she she's the one who, you know, cracks the whip as it were. And she also has some just amazing, beautiful, dark language that was given to whoever, yeah, whichever actor was playing her and could, could carry that role. So those are two of my favorites that always jump out at me. I like Viola too, but I don't say too many. <laughs> uh, well, I definitely like folk, Rosalind and Beatrice. They'd be up there for me. Um, uh, Cleopatra definitely is up there for me. Um, she, uh, she's a fascinating character to me. Um, just, uh, you know, uh, love matters to her, but there are other things that matter more. She has priorities, um, and ultimately she has a lot of dignity, though there are moments when she loses it. Um, I think that um, Marina actually uh, is a very interesting, in a comedic vein, a very interesting female character who uh, um, is presented with a sort of ridiculous challenge uh, to maintain her virginity despite the fact that she's been abducted first by pirates and then placed into a brothel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, Pericles, right. Um, yeah. And uh, so I think she's uh, a lot of, you know, I think she's a lot of fun. And, uh, so it's abducted by Pirate, put in a brothel, and maintains her chastity by sheer virtue. Talking people out yeah, of it. Yeah, she talks right. people out of, out of it. Out yeah. of it. You know, it's not necessarily the most realistic. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think, you know, she's got a definite force about her that I find very impressive. But, um, uh, there was one other while you guys were talking, I thought, oh, here are the three I'm going to talk about. Now I'm blanking out. <laughs> My favorite tragedy is King Lear. And the beginning of King Lear, for anyone who hasn't, um, this king at the end of his reign saying, okay, I'm going to retire now, I'm going to split up my kingdom amongst you and my three daughters, and you get to tell me how much you love me, and by that, get as much on, you know, get your land. And the first two suck up. The second one, you know, the first one sucks up to him. The second, the third, the second one, you know, I know what she's saying, but I, I don't want to say more. And then the youngest, Cordelia, says, "No, I'm not playing this. I love you. You're my father, but we're not going to do this. What's my What's my husband going to have if I love you all?" And then, as with all the honest characters, she gets banished. All the honest characters in King Lear end up out in the woods, out in the w world. I actually um, really like Goneril. Uh, Regan, I think, is a follower. Um, oh. But uh, Goneril impresses the hell out of me. I agree. Um, Most of the women in King Lear are really strong characters. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Goneril, uh, I, she, you know, I'm not saying she's honest, she's not, but I think uh, she decides what she wants, she goes for it um, on every level, whether it's power, uh, sex, uh, whatever. She uh, decides what she wants and, uh, and absolutely uh, goes, goes for it with tremendous force. I have this whole backstory in my head about um, Lear's wife and, um, and how old the characters are in that play. Well, that's I, I appreciate Shakespeare because, I mean, they are flawed. They're not these perfect like I said, just big, strong, beautiful women, They're, they have their flaws, like a character like that, where she's not perfect, but she's got her flaws, but she knows what she wants, and she's just as developed as a lot of the other characters. <laughs> she, she'd do okay in the George Martin novel. Oh, guys, the whole future is happening. You can go to Game of Thrones, awesome. and they just be fine. <laughs> oh, thank you, Emily. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering if we could make a distinction between feminist and strong characters? Yeah, we sort of did that at the beginning. Okay, okay, um, sorry. But yeah, yeah so we can, we can certainly address that again. Yeah, I guess we can talk about yeah, the difference between... Because I, I heard strong a lot, but not... 
Well, the strike is defined in a lot of different terms. Yeah. I mean, for example, I mentioned Marina. Marina's not a particularly strong character, but she um, knows what she wants and she goes for it. Um, and uh, it's a comedy, so she manages to succeed sort of ridiculously, but um, but she does. I, I think, uh, for me at least, the idea is one of animus, you know, in other words, uh, uh, as opposed to being simply passive or reactive, um, you have women who have agendas of their own independent of the male characters in the play. Sometimes, again, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes those agendas are about men, but not always. And, um, uh, and so, uh, if they pursue their agenda, uh, whatever it is, negative, positive, evil, good, whatever, um, that to me is um, a feminist idea. Um, because they seem to believe that women have the right to do those yeah. things. Right. And they're agents for their own desires and what they want. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. No problem. Um, the next question I wanted to ask, we sort of talked about this a little bit, and so I'll, I'll leave this to the field of people who feel like are capable of answering it. How much of the strength of these characters was dependent on the fact that it wasn't women playing them? That's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, we are talking about a period of time where England had quite literally just had three ruling queens in a row. Um, one of them was a puppet who lasted about seven days, but still. It, so, and, and the, the, the apparent, the heir apparent to the throne was a woman who was ruling her own country at that point in time. So, you know, it's like all the men, all the men in power in the immediate circle of, of Elizabethan England had died and it really bothered some folks a lot. Uh, the, the idea that a woman would be capable of running a country was kind of paradigm shattering. The, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I, you can't say that, uh, that Elizabeth was exactly a feminist. She certainly believed in her own capabilities, um, but she wasn't you know, a woman's right act, women's rights activist. She was an Elizabeth's rights act activist. <laughs> right. I think what's interesting with Elizabeth, if you've ever read her her speech at a oh great Tilsbury, the speech she gives before a battle, it's interesting because she writes and plays with that kind of re recognizing her role and saying, okay, I might have a weak stomach as a woman, but I'm also the ruler of I'm, all of I'm the king of England. I'm, I'm the king of England, essentially. Yeah. And I have the heart and soul. So, yeah. That's it, yeah. You know, she's like, I might have the body of a... People. And you know she has to say this all freaking Right, time. and so I wonder sometimes, you know, be, you know, her being a patron of Shakespeare, and, you know, them being the chosen theater troupe at the time, if there wasn't some of that playing to her, but also being aware of that, the, the how carefully she had to walk this line of, okay, yes, I'm a woman, there is a certain role I have, but I'm also a queen, and I have, have a God-given right to yeah, to do and with. very much a God-given right. I mean, that's a, that's as far as they can phrase. Right. With uh, Portia in uh, in the Merchant of Venice, the role where she she defends uh, and uses justice. I mean, acting as a lawyer. But I think the women, the proto-feminism. Shakespeare really knew his Bible, and I think yeah, I've been reading Proverbs recently, and and wisdom. Is, is, is a woman in, in, in the book of Proverbs. I mean, that sense of even the Old Testament understanding of the Holy Spirit being feminine, we don't get that. We've forgotten that. that we don't read the Hebrew Bible, but understanding that, that you've got Eve and Adam in the garden both walking with the Lord. You've got, uh, you've got Noah and his wife and the, the boys and their wives. Sadly, they're not all named, but there's some strong women. Deborah, we have others that are, that are working, and I think when when Portia gives her speeches in, in the Merchant of Venice, you also sense that now it doesn't address whether they would have been stronger or weaker or feminist if they weren't men portraying women. But I think they're really in the biblical heritage. If you read it thoroughly, you see strong women there working uh, in, in other cases, in Abigail, others throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament for a book of Luke, too. So. Yeah, Shakespeare uses uh, strong women from pretty much any mythology 
it was hands on, be it biblical or Greek, yeah, classical, or Ireland, yeah. or you know, wherever you can find a lot of Italian. So. Yeah. Um, Shakespeare's young man married Anne Hathaway. Yeah, we're going to talk woman, about his relationship with Anne. Older woman, landowner. Land owner. There's documentation that he had, at some point, he had to stand up at, at their parish with his wife and say, Do you guys mind if we pull around since we're getting married anyway? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe his daughter Suzanne may have been a little early, we don't know. Um, and he also had, after, Suzanne, after his first daughter, he had twins, a boy and a girl, which goes into place as well. So there's a female dominant household. He's in London, mm -hmm. you know, prancing around a bunch of actors while his wife has been spending her time at home running the farm, running the property. I think his family life has a lot of strong female roles. I also believe it does play into the headstrong daughter and the few mothers that show up in Shakespeare. But again, older women run, you know, presenting older women and how they relate to their husbands. Um, Susanna Shakespeare was um, married to a doctor, um, and she was, in, for all intents and purposes, also a doctor. Um, and, and she yeah. was mm -hmm. considered to be incredibly uh, intelligent. There's not a lot of documentation about her, but I've studied, I, I wrote a television pilot called Doc Shakespeare, which was <laughs> about her. Um, and uh, she was a very, uh, from what little we know about her, but it says this, that she was very intelligent. And in essence, though he was had the title of doctor and she did not, it's very clear from what little we have that she practiced medicine side by side with him. One of the, in a comedy of errors, the one healer is a woman. There are two healers. There's a, a guy who tries to exercise demons from someone mm -hmm. in a very comical way sometimes. And then there's the woman who they go to for sanctuary, Sister Amelia, who ends up being another plot point in the play. But she's the one who heals people with sir drugs, serves, and holy prayer. Mm -hmm. I, had, I just had an observation about, I'm not sure um, if there's just like a, per, if, if, if just my, my idea of, of feminism per se might just be a little bit personally a, a skewed on that, but women as uh, healers and as uh, property managers has not it's not something that someone who's not feminist doesn't have a, a background in, like as it, it being default and normal. Um, like there's a lot of cultures where you would be restricted from speaking your mind or uh, confronting a male in any given so social situation, but it's understood that at home you wear the pants. Yeah. There's, there's mm -hmm. definitely the mother archetype where you know, there's the, the shrewish wife, or, oh, you wouldn't believe my wife who, you know, she spends this and she does that. But it's understood that, yeah, she does those things, and he's making fun because he has uh, a status to uphold in public. But it's understood in private that every wife is the one who is in charge of these things because they're in charge of children and nurturing and the passive yin stuff. So while it's admirable in a, this is the way it's done, it doesn't, to me, it really add points of, of this is sexual equality because that's just sort of our burden as women. Oh, there's, there's nothing about sexual equality anywhere in Shakespeare or Elizabethan England. It's, it's not a thing. This yeah. is, that's not even under discussion. Mm -hmm. um, you can't talk about it because it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. we're, but we're not, again, we're not talking about modern ideas of feminism. We're talking about, quote, proto-feminists. Yeah. Okay. So where I'd like to go from here is to talk about modern adaptations or reinterpretations of the stories, either in film, television, or in books, um, and to talk about which characters have really been adapted quite well as a modern type of feminist figure, um, and, and what sort of your favorite 
version of that might be. I think the 10 things I hate about you, the even in the sure adaptation is really well done, really accessible, and I think takes some of the more problematic aspects of the play, like the ending for some people, and kind of fixes it in a way, in a really fun way too. Um, so that's what I've always really enjoyed, the, especially the, I can't remember the actress who plays, Kat, you know, the Catherine Roll cat. Julia Stiles. Thank you. Yeah, and just some of the speeches they give her in the English classroom where they even play with the tropes of, okay, we're learning about Shakespeare, and why are we learning about this old dead white guy, and, and almost putting those words in her mouth, kind of commenting, you know, it's almost meta in that sense, you know, commenting on the layers there. And, and Greek Fools, right? Uh, yes. Larry Miller and Allison Janney in that movie. Yes. Okay, I have to get a copy of that. I keep forgetting. Larry Miller and Allison Janney make that movie. Yes. Mm -hmm. They take it from like really clever to the best thing ever. <laughs> not, not to express an opinion as a moderator, sorry. <laughs> you can watch the young Heath Ledger. Yes. Pleasure yes. Days. And uh, <laughs> Joseph Gordon Levitt. Oh, right. Mm. Alex Mack. I don't remember her name. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I enjoy. I am, I am not qualified to answer okay. this question. I okay. uh, well, I'll keep talking. Uh, uh, you know, <coughs> I don't, I, yeah, I, I, or yeah, theatrical productions. Yeah, because okay. I, I've seen a lot of Okay, yeah, I have, I've actually seen a fair number of theatrical productions. I've seen them kind of, the way they edit lines mm -hmm. kind of gets a new spin almost more, you know, especially yeah. for certain female characters. And there's a there's a modern take on uh, The Taming of the Shrew where uh, Kat and her husband, who is such a non-entity that I can't even remember his name, he is with a P? Petruchio. Petruchio. Um, are, are collaborating at the end to win the bet. Mm -hmm. You know, where, 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 it, where it becomes the two of them going, okay, we're gonna we're gonna run this as a short con, basically, because <laughs> there's money to be made. It works. It works. Yeah. 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 I've seen a lot of versions where they do that. I've also seen versions where um, she makes a distinction between their public face and their mm -hmm. private face. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a it's a problematic play. There's just no doubt yeah. about it. Um, uh, measure for measure is another problematic play along those regards and so you know uh, any new production of those plays they've got to make a call you know right. the director the producer whatever mm -hmm. the actress and the actors and they have to make a decision about how they're going to approach mm -hmm. the endings of those plays um, some with tremendous success some with very very little yeah. success uh, I'm going to bring up Shakespeare in Love which I adore um, uh, maybe one of my favorite movies of all time, and uh, uh, Viola in, in that movie, um, both playing, you know, an actor, a male actor, I mean, Gwyneth Paltrow playing uh, Viola, playing, uh, I forget the name. Ganymede? No, no, no. no. Um, playing uh, the male actor, playing the male actor, Playing Romeo, playing the playing Juliet herself, right. um, and then also Judy Dench. I mean, don't you wish that that is that Judy Dench? Don't you hope that Elizabeth was like Judy Dench? <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, it's then I just adore that movie almost to ridiculous degree, um, and I've seen it like sixty times easily, and it makes me cry every time. Um, I just want to follow up and say you said that you used Shakespeare in Gargoyles. Yeah. Uh, did that influence in any way the strength of female characters in that show? Uh, it didn't hurt. Um, <laughs> you know, Titania is a very strong character in uh, Gargoyles. Um, very much inspired by Shakespeare's Titania. Yeah, yeah, I could, I, if I'm being really arrogant, I could argue that she's got more animus in in uh, yeah. Gargoyles than she has in uh, um, in Midsummer Night's Dream, um, but I, the way I viewed her is like um, Midsummer Night's Dream was her backstory, and so she was, you know, some of the choices she made in Gargoyles was because she evolved. Well, yeah, yeah, in other words, that she was older, you know, she had learned lessons from 
what had happened in the dream to, uh, uh, yeah, um, and so there's this uh, line about, uh, Oberon in, in Gargoyles is extremely uh, powerful from a magic standpoint, has tremendous amounts of mystic power, and Titania does too, but he's just a whole level above, um, which is for us a metaphor for physical strength. Um, and so uh, there's a point where the character of Elisa is talking to Titania, and, and um, Titania says that, you know, Oberon said, well, I don't remember the exact line, but it was something like, Oberon is all powerful. And, and Elisa says, does that mean he's always right? And Titania says, not as long as he's married. <laughs> Good one. Um, and so, you know, we had the character of Macbeth in there, and uh, we had Lady Macbeth, but we were really using the historical Gruach as opposed to Shakespeare's Macbeth, because our Lady Macbeth really was the character of Demona, who was the, um, uh, the, the gargoyle uh, that for a while was alive with Macbeth, and then they sort of betrayed each other. Um, and. Uh, I don't want to make it sound literal like Demona was playing the part of Lady Macbeth, mm -hmm. but it, but metaphorically she was the Lady Macbeth of our series. So. Mm -hmm. Generally, I tend to bristle against some of the remakes where they completely take Shakespeare out of the equation, but use the basic plot line. But there is an independent film called Scotland PA. <laughs> this is Macbeth setting up burger joint. Awesome! It's so good. Shakespeare also did that. He would go back and you know just take a basic plot and then make his play. Oh yeah. That's why I love that. Well, the Shakespeare is poetry. It's the words. Oh. The play is the thing. <laughs> but in this Scotland PA, it's in a burger joint. Macbeth is the assistant manager. His dad runs the place. Um. The three weird sisters are a bunch of hippies he bumps into at his local fair. Including Andy Dick. Andy yeah. Dick. Speed Lovitz. This guy's Christopher Walken, right? This is one of yeah, he plays Christopher Walken. Walken. And he's the detective. He's, he's yeah. McDuff. McDuff. He's the McDuff character, yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of bad company right music. And a burger joint called Macbeth. Macbeth. Yeah. <laughs> Big M on it. Would never happen in real life. Yeah, and Duncan, <laughs> Duncan, he makes donuts. Lady um, McCabe, <laughs> they take the father character, he ends up in the fryer later. And a little grease splashes on Macbeth's wife. And through the whole play, yeah, it's he's walking through the gun is trying to get pointed for this burn. I had this terrible burn. See it? It's like, your hands look fine. Look, you're flattering. But this, I got this terrible, ugly, you know. And just the interpretation was beautiful, weird. Great soundtrack. And, yeah, and back in the. In the extras, the guy mentioned that there's a lot of food references in Macbeth. There is a series of films called Shakespeare Retold, where, again, Macbeth runs a gourmet restaurant. The three weird sisters of the three guys who take out the garbage. Again, beautifully done. My wife is a big fan of their much ado about their bay. My wife is a big fan of their taming of the shrew, where Katharina, Katharina is a political figure who has money but no title. Petruchio is this guy who has a title but is the most modernist friend, no money. And they hook up and she's just angry and but driven and a you know, career woman kind of thing. But realizes she doesn't mind hanging around this guy. They're both characters of kind of both but Petruchio and Catherine are both characters of strength being kind of forced into this point where you have to deal with somebody else. Mm -hmm. I would like to take questions from the audience now, if there are any questions out there. Um, He's good. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, if you could touch on um, uh, Joss Whedon's Much Do About Nothing, because I thought um, there were two, cho or two choices that Joss Whedon made that made the, the film adaptation of that much more problematic, is having it in this sort of semi- um, concurrent standing, but not changing any of the language and still having Clark Gregg just go psychotic on Hero at the wedding, like, was very problematic. And, and Joss Whedon didn't 
provide anything to, I felt, to resolve that and left it to the audience to do that. And in fact, complicated it more by establishing this isn't just a double standard that like it's okay for the guys to go off and you know mess around during the war and then come back and the women are held to a different standard. But Hero, since in the in the prologue we see that Beatrice and Benedict have a history, um, Hero is being held to a different standard than even Beatrice in that, because he doesn't seem to be freaking out about yeah. Beatrice's scene. So, and that's <coughs> not like part of that play. I think the whole thing of role of hero is hard to update, I guess, unless oh. you establish a... I actually don't think hero is hard to update. I think Claudia is hard Claudia, to update. Claudia, yes, thank you. Um, you know, my, I, I keep talking about things I've written that didn't get done, like Dr. Shakespeare, <laughs> but I, uh, my brother and I wrote a, a modernization of Much Ado About Nothing, where um, we tried to sneak in some of Shakespeare's language, but uh, we mostly just uh, said it at a uh, spring training at a baseball, uh, a major league baseball. <laughs> um, and the, the difficulty is Claudio, because um, Claudio's reaction is, is so severe at that wedding that it's hard to have any sympathy for him whatsoever if you want to sort of bring it back around um, I think there are problematic aspects of, uh, of Whedon's film, although I did like it a lot. Uh, uh, mostly, I think, because Amy Acker is so incredibly amazing. That, you know, when she says, kill Claudio, I felt like, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> so for you, you got it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a big fan, personally, of... Uh, um, Emma Thompson's Beatrice in uh, and in uh, the Much Do About Nothing that Kenneth Bernard did. I love that movie too, um, and I actually think uh, because it is set in you know Renaissance Italy, uh, it works a little better. Um, it's easier to buy into, um, and uh, Robert Sean Leonard is a much more sympathetic Claudio than. Um, than they managed to pull off, than we managed to pull off. Um, but, you know, there's a, it, it's, I, I don't think, you know, you have to buy into every, you know, sometimes uh, movies have aspects that you just go, well, that didn't work. Uh, any, or movies isn't, not just movies, but any, I see a lot of Shakespeare. I'm going to Ashland, Oregon for the Shakespeare Festival in August, and I'll see eight plays, and five days, and, um, uh, and you know, you, you'll see production and you'll go, wow, this is great, 90% of it worked, and then, you know, that moment didn't quite come together for me, but you know, I, I think you can find enjoyment in the aspects that do work and still not buy into the entire thing, and then when you find one that you really didn't sort of lose yourself in from beginning to end, then it becomes a truly sort of transcendent experience. One aspect of the play is, job, right there. One aspect of the play, Joss Wheaton would have these parties with his friends, where they'd sit around and do Shakespeare in his home. That house in the film is his home. This is him on a weekend with his friends, and they decide to bring in a camera and do this production. And you know, the, there's a level of disbelief. I mean, the language is obviously Shakespeare, beautifully done. Um, and I'm actually saying that Shakespeare's not perfect. There are problem characters. There are scenes that necessarily don't work, but I imagine they didn't have time to go through them all. Yeah, I was going to say that, yeah, yeah. they were like, we're going to do this, that there wasn't time to discuss. So when we get to that scene, are we going to do something new with it or let it stand? And it's set after a war. Right. A war where nobody died, apparently. And, you know, when modern interpretations, they kind of take things out, you know. Um, I saw a Hamlet recently where they didn't mention photographs hardly at all. Mm. And now the blue hair was raising a longer hand for a long time. Uh, so, if I remember from my Shakespeare class, we talked a lot about the hero, Claudio, and Beatrice, Benedict, like, foiling. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that might be where some of that problematic tension comes from? Because, again, 
Shakespeare class was a little while ago. Um, weren't they from two different plays entirely that Shakespeare kind of knit together and said, these are interesting foils, basically? <coughs> like, that, that's the sense that I got from some of the discussions. Like, does that... Not to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, not no. I think the... In Much Ado About Nothing, you have two characters who, gen who fall in love with each other, meet each other first time and fall in love, and that doesn't work out. And then you have the two characters who immediately butt heads, and like, you know they're going to hook up at the end. <laughs> and that contrast between the couples yeah. that I think plays up so well. And the fact that everybody's trying to plot to get them together when you know it's going to happen. I mean, and in Much Ado About Nothing, the beginning scene where Benedict and is leaving Catherine. Catherine and Benedict and Beatrice apparently hooked up before. That was purely Joss Whedon's speculation. That wasn't in the play itself. Well, there's there's definitely a history in the, in oh, yeah, the, yeah, between the two of them on whether or not they actually mm -hmm. had sex, I suppose, is, is uh, an extrapolation. But, she, uh, yeah. in the beginning of the play, she asks about him. Yeah. In a very insulting way, but she does ask about the one guy she apparently doesn't like. Right, and she says she gave him his heart. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, you know when, when we wrote our adaptation of it, um, the solution we came up with was that uh, at the end of the play, the, the equivalent Beatrice and Benedict characters um, wind up together, and the sense you get is that Hero and Claudia, Claudio are maybe on a path to getting back together. That's how we solve the problem. That instead of it all wrapping up in a nice tight little bow with, with two couples and that kind of thing, one of the things that we tried because it was just too hard um, uh, for them to just immediately, for her to just immediately forgive um, what Claudio had done. And, and we, we adapted what Claudio did too, but we just said, well, okay, he had been misled and she now, he, but he needed to reestablish trust with her. And another thing to remember is that at the time that Shakespeare was writing, the concept of psychological realism in literature was a very, very, very new thing. It was weird and experimental. This was not how you wrote plays. So. Uh, and also, I, I just want one of the things you said, you know, we, the notion that we all knew Beatrice and Benedict were going to wind up together. Well, they're the archetype for that. I mean, and when Shakespeare's audience was watching that, that idea that two people that hostile to each other, um, you know, we take it for granted when we see the character, you know, Sam and Diane on Cheers or something like that. Finally, we take it for granted, all right, yes, you know, uh, David and Maddie, they're going to wind up to, you know, we know that. Um, but I, I think in, in those days, you could see, if it's well done, you'd, you'll, you'd see the spark between them, but will, you know, you just have, yeah, will they, you know, how do you, could they manage to do it? I think, you know, now it's almost a cliche, but at the time it wasn't. It was quite original. Well, they're, they're, one, of the, one of the cool things about Beatrice and Benedict, right, is that their names match. <laughs> Okay, so I, my family background, is, half of it is Mennonite, and I can see much ado happening in this day and age in that community, where if you have, well, basically most of the production. Well, most of the, most of the marriages that occur still now, the first child is always a preemie, because it's always within the nine months after the marriage has occurred. It may be an eight pound preemie at six months, <laughs> but it's, so basically it's, if there's hooking up before marriage, as long as it's with the person that you're getting married to, that wasn't considered to be a huge thing. But if you found out that your future wife was going to be, it was, had hooked up with somebody else, that was something you just, no, didn't happen, and that's this day and age. So I can see something like that happening within that construct where if he found out, oh no, she didn't fool around, she wasn't with somebody else, oh, now I can marry her again. So that would be considered to be completely and totally acceptable in that city. So maybe if you set it up in the, you know, in the Amish community or down in the Bible Belt. 
Yeah, but it's, yeah. I can see that happening. I would watch that Dutch. <laughs> I, amongst my collection, I have a Yiddish King Lear. Oh! <laughs> set in a family. Did you see the one that was at the Guthrie quite a few years ago where they did it in five different languages? Yeah. I haven't, but I'm fascinated by the, the Globe Theater does productions of different And no shows. intermission. Yeah, well, I've seen, like, I've, seen <laughs> Macbeth, I've, seen, I've seen the Zulu Macbeth Ulu Vata. It's amazing. Zulu, yeah. Well, yes, that was amazing. The Globe, and it's, yeah, it's amazing to see yeah, the, how the different iterations. I've seen Shakespeare in Japan and heard it in Japanese. Well, and, you know, uh, Throne of Blood is brilliant, yeah. and Ron is yeah, I mean, you Kurosawa, and I would say without Kurosawa, we wouldn't have Star Wars, but without, we wouldn't have Kurosawa without Shakespeare. Was well, somebody down the other end about to mention uh, David Crystal's original pronunciation productions? Is that, I thought somebody started to, yeah. In the previous panel, I mentioned the OP. Yeah, but, so there's this, this guy, this linguist named David Crystal, and one of the things he does is reconstructs the Elizabethan accent and then teaches Shakespearean actors to speak in it. <clears throat> um, and they have discovered all sorts of interesting things, like there are a lot of puns that are lost in modern pronunciation. Most of them filthy because it's Shakespeare. <laughs> and if you, think, if you think it's a dick joke, it's a dick joke. <laughs> if you don't think it's a dick joke, it's because you missed the dick joke. <laughs> the beginning of Romeo and Juliet is uh, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. 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 From ancient grudge break forth to new mutinies, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the vacant lines of these two foes, two star-crossed lovers take their life. Lines and loins, and two family lines from their, yeah. you know, loins. Yeah. And it's just, that, again, the language adds so much to it, it actually makes it a little faster. It does, yeah, the, the, yeah. the productions are, are minutes faster because the, the speech pattern is, is more quick. That was probably crap, but that was the, what it sounds like. It's a very northern sounding language. I love that. I just like that households sound like assholes, because I'm growing up. <laughs> Shakespeare is, 12 is the golden age of Shakespeare. <laughs> I, mm, we, we took my friend's kids to see a production of Romeo and Juliet at the Guthrie. Figuring it would be you know, relatively classical or really well done, and then they ended up playing, really playing up the dirty jokes. And just Especially kind of, that opening yeah. street scene. There's an yeah. opening street scene, there's a point where they're like, he has a beer bottle of beer and it's spraying around in a very phallic manner. And we're walking out of intermission and I had to say, Shakespeare's dirty. I know, you're telling me I had to teach that to 15 year olds. Yeah. <laughs> Here comes Romeo, that's Rome, right Rome and a dried herring. I mean, it's the Doesn't that make them more interesting? At least. Well, and it's funny because sometimes they, you know, some. Some of them will pick up on it and go, oh, those aren't rapiers. Though. I can't get it. And then the other kids are like, what? What? Oh, there's that one kid who giggles the wrong way. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of... Oh, my Shakespeare's dirty. Yeah. My, my favorite bits is what, are, are when uh, Shakespeare is making extended dick jokes about his own name. <laughs> there are two, two entire sonnets that consist of nothing but willy jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is as it should be. Well, yes. <laughs> getting off topic, but I've seen some, I've seen some cow bands that, um, that uh, you know. Yeah. I know. Uh, well, you talk about Miranda. That's related to them. Yeah. <laughs> we have one minute. So oh. whatever you can talk about. Miranda, discuss. <laughs> She's awesome and she questions. I like that. Uh, we have one question. Yeah. Um, yeah so I guess briefly, uh, we. Uh, we uh, Portia came up a little earlier, and obviously Merchant of Venice is a little problematic for non-feminist related reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not even talking about all the race problems. Race problems. Race problems. Race problems. Yeah. I mean, not nearly as much as a lot of prototypical Jewish villain <laughs> stories in the contemporary period. But uh, um, I mean, Portia is very strong in terms of. I mean, she's basically an utterly dominant figure throughout the entire play. She solves the whole crisis more or less single-handedly, and then emasculates her husband in every conceivable respect. Uh, hey, hey, give me that ring. I know your wife said never give me give, give away that ring, but it's mine now. Ah, and oh, you gave away that ring. Screw you. Um, uh, so I'm just wondering. I guess not a lot of time for it, but if uh, the if that racial dimension makes it 
or, I mean, since she's sort of the face of this society that's doing this to Shylock, does that make it more or less of a feminist character? Yeah, I think I think the answer is that shitty people can be feminist too. <laughs> yeah, right. Like Lady Mackers is definitely a feminist figure, but she's not a good person. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with that. I mean, the fact that uh, that she takes action and, I mean, you know, one could argue also that she gives him every opportunity to, um, you know, to be merciful. He refuses and then she just breaks him. Um, and he asks for mercy and, he's, and she's like, hey, Mercy was on the table. You took it off the table. Um, by the way, I have huge problems with Merchant of Venice, but, but um, that's not necessarily one of them. Um, I just, I know we're out of time, but I just finally remember what that third character I wanted to bring up was, <laughs> which was Amelia from Othello. Oh, yeah. um, supporting character. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Desdemona is interesting to me as well, but. Amelia is actually even more interesting to me because uh, she's married to Iago and for most of the play she more or less believes that he's a decent guy but she's got issues with him and she doesn't like how jealous he is and she doesn't like how suspicious she is and she begins to, as the play progresses, to get more and more, particularly in some productions I've seen, get more and more suspicious of him and in the end takes action at the risk of her own life um, at the cost of her own life. Uh, and uh, so that was the third one. I just wanted to. We are really out of time, so if you have any questions, I'm sure the panelists will be here for a minute if you want to come up and talk to anyone. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the panelists for being here. Thank you. Thank you.